internet has always been the ultimate source of information, most of which is available for free, but plenty of it is confidential and protected mostly by a string of characters which ensures controlled distribution of that information. Yes, I'm talking about password. And ever since the dawn of the internet, the email password combination has been the most popular method of verifying owners of a particular piece of information. Implementing email password authentication while ensuring proper security of the data used to be a very cumbersome process. And it still is. But thanks to Firebase and the APIs that it provides, you can now implement authentication in a matter of minutes, provided that your project builds successfully in the first try. And you're like... Hello and welcome everyone to another video in the Firebase Authentication series. Today we'll explore the authentication APIs that Firebase provides. We'll learn to implement them and look at how to ensure that our users who have logged in once never get to see the authentication screen unless they log out. Previously we worked on implementing some classes and state management, basically worked towards building a strong foundation. And now we are just going to build features on top of that foundation. If you haven't already seen that video, you should go check it out. If you're here just to briefly understand Firebase's email authentication process, you can check out the timestamps. We created a Firebase project in the previous video. It's time to let our project know the type of authentication we wish to implement. Go to the authentication page and under sign in tab, you can see a list of providers that Firebase supports. Click on the edit button in front of the email password provider and enable this auth provider. And as for passwordless sign in, we might explore that in a future video so you can keep it disabled for now. Let's head back to our Flutter project and add the necessary Firebase and authentication dependencies. We can get them by going over to the pub. Oh, not this pub. <laughs> Definitely not this one. Finally, pub.dev. So we want Firebase core and Firebase auth. I'll copy them one by one and paste them in the pubspec.yml file. After adding the dependencies, let's head over to the main.dart and inside the main function, I will write widgets flutter binding dot ensure initialized. Firebase dot initialize app communicates with the native platform to initialize Firebase. The ensure initialized function ensures that flutter's binding with native platform was successful. We will asynchronously initialize Firebase app and catch any errors that might be thrown. Don't forget to mark the main method as asynchronous. Great. Now we'll create a service that takes care of the entire authentication process. We'll call it auth service and it will be present inside of the services folder of the data directory. The first thing we need to do here is to get an instance of Firebase auth and assign it to a final variable of type Firebase auth. Oh, it seems like Flutter auth is not successfully added to my project. So I can just open up the terminal and write flutter pub get and that fixes the problem. If you look into member variables and functions of this class, you can find a getter called current user. This returns with details of a currently logged in user. And if no user is logged in, it returns null. We will create a getter called get current user, which returns this value. Now in the home screen, we can use this get current user to check if a user is logged in or not. Then show the appropriate screen, right? Well, yes, but no. You can do it if you wish, but it can create some inconsistencies as this is just a variable that will have to be reinitialized. So instead of depending on a variable, we should use something that can provide authentication updates in real time. Firebase auth maintains a stream of type user question mark called auth state changes. Let's assign it to the auth changes function. The user question mark implies that this stream deals with data where it could either return null or a user object. This stream returns null when no auth session has been created. In other words, when no user has logged in. Next, I will create a signup function of type future user. It takes an email and a password. Right now, we are only going to go over authentication. So we will not be registering user details in Firestore. We will only create Firebase user accounts. Now you need to call create user with email and password on the Firebase auth instance and pass the email and password values. This returns with a user credential. We will check if the user credential has a user. If it does, we will return that user or else we will throw a custom exception with message user was null. We should also wrap the entire thing with a try catch block. The exception that we are looking to catch is going to be of type Firebase exception. And on catching it, we will throw a custom exception with the message provided by Firebase exception. It's time for us to create a screen that I like to call auth state builder. Basically, this screen is going to be responsible for checking the authentication state of the user and display the appropriate page. 
let's go to the screens directory and create another folder called authentication. Let's move the provider selection screen inside authentication. At the base of the screens folder, we will create a file and call it authstatebuilder.dart. This will be a stateless widget which builds a stream builder of type user question mark. Now, which stream deals with this type of data? That's right, it's the auth state changes stream we defined in auth service. So let's pass it here. Builder returns with context and snapshot. If the snapshot has data, that means the user is logged in and we'll show a landing screen. Or else, we'll show the provider selection screen. I'll create a landing screen inside of the landing folder. This will be a stateless widget as well, which will return a scaffold, then container of width infinity, and then a column. I will set the main axis alignment of this column to center to vertically center all of its children. The first child, and the only child for now, is gonna be an action button that says log out. And I'm just going to leave the on pressed empty for now. We should not be required to specify is busy and is enabled for the button every time we create it. So let's head over to the widgets definition and make the is busy and is enabled parameters as optional. Is busy will be false and is enabled will be true when left unspecified. Let's also go over to the auth state builder and import the landing screen. Right now, when I click on the email password provider, I'm taken to this empty screen. And this happens because we have provided a container as the landing screen for this authentication provider. In authentication, create a directory named email and I will create a file under it named email password screen dart. This will be a stateless widget which returns a scaffold, then a container of infinite width and I'll give it a margin from the top of 50 units. Next, specify a column with center alignment. Now I'll create a text widget that says the name of the provider and give it a style of headline 3. Let's give some vertical spacing using a size box. Now in order to facilitate sign up, we need to create a view with mandatory form fields. So I'll create a stateful widget called signup view and pass it to the column right after the size box. Inside the signup view, we start by returning a form, which contains a column. The first child of this column is going to be a text form field. I'll give it a decoration, input decoration, label text will say email, and hint text can contain the expected value format. Now I'll just replicate this widget down here. If you're wondering how I did this, on Mac, it is done by selecting the lines to be copied, then holding down Option, Shift, and tapping the down or up arrow key, depending on where you want this to be copied. On Windows, you can hold Alt and Shift to do the same. You'll never look back to using the keyboard and mouse combo once you get hooked to using this. Also comment down some other cool shortcuts which you think are awesome in VS Code or any other ID that everyone should know about. Coming back to the replicated text form field, it will expect user's name, now, Firebase does not require a username to create an account. This is something you would want your users to specify so that you can store this information in Firestore. But we won't be going over that, at least not in this video. This video is all about signing up. The next field is going to be a password field, so we'll provide appropriate label and hint text. Let's also target the obscure text parameter and set it to true to hide the text being entered. Great! Now, how do we extract the user provided values and process them? The first thing we should do is create three private variables, namely email, password, and name. We know for sure that these variables won't be null during their utilization, even though we are not initializing them during declaration. So it's safe for us to add the late keyword to tell the dot compiler that these variables will be initialized soon enough and should not be treated as null. Be very careful while using the late keyword, because you might end up using the variable marked late sooner than it was initialized and then Dart throws a late initialization error and you just keep scratching your head thinking where you went wrong. Each form field comes with an onSaved functional parameter. OnSaved returns with the value entered within the text field by the user. As soon as this function is triggered, we will rebuild the UI and assign the entered value to the corresponding variables. The exclamation mark is known as the null check operator which tells the compiler that this value is not null, since the value returned by the onSaved function is of type string question mark. Therefore, we are just countering that question mark by explicitly specifying the received value as a non-null value. The next question is, who triggers the onSaved function? So let's create an action button. But before that, the UI looks too cramped up. So let's give some vertical spacing between these text fields. Hmm, looks good. Now I will pass sign up as a text for this action button. Is busy will be false and on pressed will trigger on action button tab. I will create an empty on action button tab function. We still don't know what triggers the on saved for these fields. Well, 
Each form maintains a state and we can get a hold of that state by creating a global key. So we'll create a global key of type form state and name it form key. Then I will initialize it. This form key must be passed to a form before it is used. Then inside the on action button tab, I will call form key.currentState.save. This current state.save is what triggers the on saved function for all the text fields within the form and performs the instructions provided in that block. In this case, the instructions are to transfer the user input to those variables. Let's create a provider for implementing state management on this screen. Navigate to the states folder and create another folder named auth providers. Then create a file called email password auth data dot art. Class email password auth data will extend the auth data class we created in the last video. This class will have two simple functions, one for signing in and another for sign up. Let's work on sign up. I'll name it sign up using email and password, and it will take name, email, and password, all of which are required. This will be an asynchronous function, so I'll write async, then start off with a try catch block. And I know that the only exception that can be thrown will be of type custom exception. So I will catch it and call utils.showSnackBar with a message provided by the exception. We'll start by marking the UI busy. The setBusy function comes from the auth data class we made in the previous video. Then I will call authService.signup. In fact, we can just create an object of this auth service within the auth data provider so that it can be inherited by all the other classes that extend it. Now I can just call authService.signup, pass in the email and password and wait for it to return a user object. Now we can do whatever we want with this user object, which right now is nothing. Or maybe we can just log the user's UID. Let's call set free to change the UI state from busy to free. Oh, and we should also call set free inside the custom exception. Since we wish to use this change notifier using a provider, we have to add it to the widget tree as a change notifier provider by declaring it within the multi provider widget. Let's look at how to implement this in the UI. I will head back to the email password screen and within the on action button tab, I will write email password auth data, create a private variable of that name, provider.off context of type email password auth data, and I will set listen to false. This is the way we get the instance of a provider. All the variables and functions of this class become reusable and are not reset, which would have happened in case we created an object of this class. The listen false is necessary here as we are telling the provider that we only wish to access the class members and are not interested in listening to the changes that the state might go through. If we don't do this, an error like this will pop up. Next, we can simply call sign up using email and password, pass in a name, email and password, and that's it. Any error that might occur will be handled by this function by showing a snack bar. Now, this is as clean and simple as it gets. The action button's is busy property is statically set to false. We need to wrap this button within a consumer widget. A consumer widget acts as a listener to state changes of a provider. So we will specify the type of provider that we wish to listen to. In this case, it is email password auth data. Then the builder parameter returns with a context, the provider instance and a child widget. We have not specified a child widget and we do not wish to use this parameter. So we can just leave it empty with the help of an underscore and return the action button while setting the isBusy property to email password auth data dot isBusy. So now when the user taps this button, the UI will be marked busy and this button will start showing a circular progress indicator. Oh, and don't forget to change the landing screen from a container to email password screen for this auth provider model. Let's test this out. Here we are seeing the provider selection screen because no user is logged in. That decision is made by auth state builder. Next, I'll type in some email, password and a name, then click sign up. The UI goes into busy state and the button starts showing the circular progress indicator. And once the user is created, the UID is logged in the terminal. Let's take a look at the Firebase console. In the authentication screen, we can see that the user was created with email password auth provider. So why are we still on the same screen? Well, we started our journey from the auth state builder in logged out state. Then we went to a provider landing screen. And on successful authentication, we remained on that screen even though the auth state builder changed its state from logged out to logged in. Solution to this problem is pretty simple. Just write a navigator.pop after the authentication and we are good to go. But it's not the best solution as it is not generic. In this case, the authentication is just one level deep. But what if we had more levels? A single navigator.pop won't be able to get us the desired results. 
So instead of thinking about leaving this screen to reach auth state builder, what if we go to the auth state builder and remove all the previous routes? That seems like a perfect solution to this problem. So let's navigate to utils folder and I will create a function called remove all and push, which will push the current route and remove all the previous routes. This will be a static function and it will take a destination screen. I will call push and remove until method on one context object. The same method is also provided by Flutter's Navigator API, and that's what one context uses as well. We'll pass in a material page route, just like it is done generally. There's just one extra parameter here called predicate. This predicate acts as a conditional check. So when the predicate returns false, Flutter stops removing routes. So if you have say 5 to 10 routes in your backstack, except for a route maybe with a specific name, you can compare a route's properties and return appropriate boolean value. Although in this case, I wish to remove all the routes, so I will simply return false. Now I can simply go over to the email password auth data and call utils.removeall and push, and then pass the auth state builder. Also, let's make this signout button functional. I will go over to the auth service, create a function called signout, mark it as sync, create a try catch block inside of which I will call the signout function on the auth instance, and try to catch a 5 ways auth exception which could be thrown by this function and then I will simply throw a custom exception. Next, just go over to the landing screen and in the on press of this button, I will mark this function as a sync and await for authservice.signout to finish. On a successful logout, show a snack bar that says logged out and wrap everything within a track edge block which catches a custom exception and shows an error snack bar with error message. So let's test this again. I'm on the provider selection screen, I will select email sign in, then enter an email, name, and password. After that, I'll tap sign in, we'll go into busy state, then the sign up is successful and the app takes us to the correct route. Alright, so this test was successful. And on clicking the logout button, I'm again taken back to the provider selection screen, since the snapshot returned by auth state changes was null. And with that, we have successfully learned how to sign up new users for our app. In the next video, we'll take a look at facilitating sign in for our users. I will also go over the implementation of form validation. So keep an eye out for that video as it's going to be really important. In fact, you don't really have to worry about actively keeping an eye out. The video will be released in 3 days from now. So you can just tap that bell icon next to the subscribe button. And if you're new, please subscribe to the channel and then tap that bell icon. The code for this video is linked in the description. Let me know if you have any other suggestions or feedbacks in the comments below. Hope you're all having a great day. This is the CS Guy, signing off.